so this will allow us to um, let others who might be in time zones that aren't really um, amenable to uh, listening in right now to listen to your talks um, as they move forward and get on about their days. Um, again, uh, we uh, aim to meet quarterly in this conference. We're open to anyone who's interested in speaking now or in the future. Um, our real goals are to um, provide a platform for people, um, particularly who are younger, who may be not in a position typically to attend in-person meetings, um, who are kind of growing in the field and um, and uh, to disseminate our research and have thoughtful conversation widely. Um, Karina is the co-host um, of this particular meeting, although she's out on maternity leave, so she um, will join us. She's able, um, um, but we've been doing this uh, for about, I think, a year and a half now, um, and, and the conferences have been quite good. So um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Laura Negrado. She is a neurologist at Fleni in Buenos Aires, Argentina. And she's going to speak to us about the epidemiology of MS and oligoclonal bands, um, a Latin American overview focused on Argentina. Um, with that, uh, Dr. Negrado. Well, thank you very much, Helen, for the introduction. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to present this. So I'm going to share the screen. So are you seeing my screen correctly? OK, great. So as you well said, I'm going to speak about the epidemiology of MS and oligoclonal bands in Latin America and focusing especially in Argentina. So these are my disclosures, which none are relevant for this talk. So Latin America is a very vast territory with a very large population. And in this territory, we have a very marked variability regarding climate, altitude, sun exposure, economic development, and ethnic composition, among others. And in general, it is a low to medium MS prevalence area. And there are several difficulties to assess MS prevalence here due to different methodologies used in the different studies, heterogeneous data sources, lack of official government statistics, and studies conducted at different times. Also, a lack of clear differentiation between MS and NMO before the, the development of the Aquaparin 4 essay. Despite these limitations, this figure summarizes the available prevalence figures in Latin America. As you can see here, the highest uh, prevalence has been reported in Puerto Rico of 69 every 100,000 individuals, followed by Buenos Aires of 38, and then Uruguay, Southern Brazil, and Northern Mexico, while the lowest prevalence has been reported in Chile, Bolivia, Peru, Ecuador, and Central America. There is fewer reports of incidence of MS in Latin America, but also it is a lower incidence area compared to other regions of the world. And again, the highest incidence has been reported in Puerto Rico. And also some uh, countries have reported familiar MS, which on the same line still seems to be less frequent compared to other regions of the world. The highest familiar MS frequency has been reported in Argentina around 10%. And there are several ethnic, genetic, and environmental factors that probably explain the lower prevalence of MS in our area. And I'm going to explain a bit about ethnicity because I think it is a very relevant factor. Latin America is a very complex uh, area regarding ethnicity due to a very complex admixture along the years. And there is a very marked variability of this uh, contribution of the several groups in the different areas. It results from the admixture of white European Caucasian, Native Americans and Black Africans but for example, Mexico, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, and Chile are areas with a very high contribution of uh, Native Americans, while Black African contribution is found mainly in Brazil, Colombia, and the Caribbean. And on the other hand, white European Caucasian ancestry is located mainly in Argentina, Uruguay, and Southern Brazil. And this variability in the ethnic composition is very relevant for uh, MS epidemiology, as we will see later on. So regarding ethnicity and genetic factors, MS is very rare in non-mixed Native Americans from Central and South America. So a protective role of 
mongoloid genes in Native Americans has been suggested, and the susceptibility is probably conferred by the introduction of European Caucasian genes. And this is supported by the higher prevalence of MS in regions with a higher percentage of European ancestry, the higher frequency of European ancestry in MS compared to controls, for example, in Mexico, and the similar risk alleles in Latin American and Caucasian MS patients. But of course, we have less uh, genetic studies in, in our population. Of course, uh, genetics factors are not the only factors that are relevant, as suggested by uh, migration studies, such as this one performed in the French West Indies, in which they showed that migration before the age of 15 seems to be the most relevant. And this strongly suggests that environmental factors are also very important. And I'm not going to go in detail into environmental factors, but we all know that UV radiation is very relevant. And as you can see in this map, in general, uh, in Latin America, UV radiation is higher compared to North America and Europe. And UV radiation and sun exposure is related mainly to vitamin D, but also several other chromophores and melatonin that has been shown to contribute to the seasonality of multiple sclerosis relapses. And another possible environmental factor that is very relevant is the hygiene hypothesis. Since Latin America is composed mainly by developing countries, uh, infections such as parasites are more frequent in other air, in our area. But the point I really want to focus on today is the latitudinal gradient. So uh, MS prevalence has been shown to have a latitudinal gradient being more prevalent farther away from the equator, but it's not so clear if this is true in Latin America. There is some evidence supporting this, such as this meta-analysis published 10 years ago, showing a small latitudinal gradient of 0 0.3 every 100,000 individuals per degree of latitude from Panama to Argentina. But there is several evidence that points against this. For example, the fact that there is a very different prevalence of MS in northern Mexico compared to southern USA, despite them being at the very same latitude. Also, the um, Patagonia project, which was a study performed in the year 2008, in which the prevalence of MS was assessed in four different locations of the Patagonia, which is a region of the south of Argentina, extending from 39 to 55 degrees south, and no latitudinal gradient was found. And a similar study, but assessing the incidence of MS was performed in Chile, and uh, which is also a very latitude-wise extensive country and found no latitudinal gradient. Of course, as you can see in this figure, the incidence was really higher in the south of Chile, in the Magallanes region, but that is also where the highest uh, contribution of European Caucasian ancestry is found. So that could be the explanation. Another uh, piece of evidence against this is, as you can see here in the in this world MS prevalence map, this is taken from the Atlas of MS, is that South America is located at the same latitude as Australia and New Zealand. And despite this, the prevalence is much lower. And this is probably related to the genetic contribution due to different European migration. Australia and New Zealand re receive mainly European migration from the UK, which is a very high MS prevalence area, while Latin America received mainly uh, European migration from Spain, Portugal, and Italy, which are lower prevalence area compared to UK. Regarding oligoclonal bands prevalence, the same has been shown as with MS prevalence. This uh, figure is taken from a meta-analysis by Ruth Dobson, in which uh, she showed again this latitudinal gradient being more prevalent farther away from the equator and also that the prevalence of oligoclonal bands in clinically definite MS was 89% and in CIS patients a bit lower, 67%. So when I was reading this uh, for a presentation, I started thinking if this was extrapolable for, for our population, if we could apply this for our population, we are used in Latin America to apply this information uh, from other populations to our patients, but I think this is not always correct because they are they are different in so many ways but just to think about this if we could extrapolate this to our population for example we would expect 
a prevalence of 60% of oligoclonal bands in Salta, which is a city in the north of Argentina, of 70% in Buenos Aires, and of 95% in Ushuaia, which is in the southernmost region of Argentina. And this is very relevant for us because, as you may all know, the oligoclonal bands have been included in the last revision of the McDonald criteria, and the absence of oligoclonal bands is a red flag. So it is important to know the real prevalence of oligoclonal bands in our patients, in our clinical practice. So uh, while I was thinking about this and planning this study that I will show you in a few minutes, this other meta-analysis was published also showing this latitudinal gradient in, of oligoclonal bands in Latin America. A few years ago, uh, multicentric uh, Argentinian registry was established. It's a strictly observational registry called Relevar M of MS and NMO patients. So this made me think that this was a good opportunity to answer these two questions. What was the real prevalence of oligoclonal bands in our population? And if there was really a latitudinal gradient of oligoclonal bands, and this is what we did actually. This has been uh, recently accepted in the Multiple Sclerosis and Related Disorders Journal. And there are some strengths for this study and of course some limitations which I will discuss. The first obvious strength is the large number of patients. We have 2,866 patients. And the other strength is the representation of all the provinces of Argentina. We have patients from all the provinces, of course, in, in different numbers, but we have from all the provinces. Of these patients, 92 were MS patients, 60, 6% sorry, were CIS patients, and 2% were RIS patients. Lumbar puncture was performed in 55% of these patients. And of these, 74% of patients had oligoclonal bands, which of course was a bit lower than what we expected. And one of the main limitations of this study was that the method by which the oligoclonal bands were tested was not, uh, was not in the registry. So as a way to overcome this limitation, since we know that the technique used to measure the bands is very important, we performed an online questionnaire to the PIs of each of the centers asking in which percentage the oligoclonal bands were tested using isoelectrofocusing and we excluded the centers that reported using other methods in, in more than, I mean, that they used isoelectric focusing in less than 95% of patients or that the method wasn't known. After ex excluding these centers, we excluded around 500 patients, but as you can see here, the positivity remained almost unchanged. And here are the results. Two important points. One I want to show you first is that the province of residence of the patient and the province of the treating center of the same patient differed in 33% of patients. And I think this is very important because many of these meta-analyses that I showed you before, when they use studies from Argentina, they are usually studies from MS referral centers located in Buenos Aires and they automatically locate them at the latitude of Buenos Aires. But these patients, at least 30% of these patients probably do not live in Buenos Aires. So this is important. And the other thing is, well, of course, we tested for linear correlation and multivariable uh, logistic regression analysis, and we found no correlation or no association whatsoever with province of residence of the patients and latitude. Here you can see it also uh, with a geographical representation. So we don't seem to have a latitudinal gradient, at least in Argentina. So in conclusion, Latin America seems to be a low to medium MS prevalence region. A possible small latitudinal gradient exists in MS and in oligoclonal advanced prevalence between countries, but probably not within countries. There seems to be a lower prevalence of oligoclonal advanced in Argentina and the regional variations in ethnic ancestry could account for these differences in prevalence attributed to latitude. So thank you very much. And if you have any questions, I would be happy to 
answer them or try to answer them. Laura, thank you for a really excellent talk. Uh, this uh, presentation is open for questions. I'd ask you to unmute yourself um, in order to ask any questions. Um, so Laura, do you know among the people who live in Argentina, you know, whether or not, um, it sounds like the, there haven't, hasn't been a lot of genotyping done, but you know, in people who have pretty confirmed, you know, clinically confirmed MS, um, does the, have you had a chance to look at whether the presence of oligoclonal bands differs across like genetic background? You mentioned that as potentially relevant. Mm -hmm. That hasn't been looked at. And of course, after this study, I think the, the next step would be to look at that. That would be our, our next step. And we're planning to do that. I would like to look at genetic background and maybe some of the environmental factors, probably Epstein virus. And if we could look at some other vitamin D, cotinine, I don't know. But I think it would be interesting to study this difference between oligoclonal band positive and negative patients. But I think it's interesting to know that one out of four of our patients will not have oligoclonal bands. And were you, you know, as we know, we, there are, um, you know, we expect that more people may develop bands with a longer disease course. That's why they were reincorporated. Were you able to look at, you know, duration of disease as um, a predictor in your cohort? This, uh, this registry, of course, is it's kind of limited because it's not a prospective registry in which they're included at diagnosis. They're included at different time points, so there are very different time points of each patient. We don't have those those data, but that could, of course, uh, influence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Really interesting. Are there other questions um, from other members of the group? Well, congratulations on your really great work. Uh, and Thank you very others much. Have, if others have questions for Laura before she leaves and has to go back to maybe put them in the chat and if she's had to go back and see patients, I will communicate them um, to her um, offline. All right, great. So our next speaker is Dr. Catherine Fitzgerald or Kate. <laughs> she's an assistant professor of neurology and epidemiology here at the Johns Hopkins University. And she's gonna speak to us today about metabolic network alterations and multiple sclerosis. Thanks for coming, Kate. So today I'm gonna to be giving an update on one of our studies um, looking at metabolomic differences in people with multiple sclerosis. Um, so as I'm sure we're all aware, the etiology of MS is multifactorial. Uh, similarly, disease evolution is highly heterogeneous and predictors of how MS evolves aren't well defined. Uh, both processes likely involve multiple levels of biologic interactions with genetic, at least from an MS risk side, and iron environmental contributors. Uh, molecular profiling of circulating small molecules using metabolomics integrates many of these systems and may help us understand um, disease etiology and um, evolution. Uh, so what is metabolomics? Uh, metabolomics is the large-scale study of small molecules and cells, tissues, biofluids, or organisms. Uh, it includes the study of substrates and products of metabolism that are both influenced by genetic and environmental factors, as well as the composition and activity of the gut microbiota. Uh, many metabolites are the products of chemical reactions, and um, metabolomics profiles are more or less a snapshot in time. Um, so many reactions take place continuously with cells, within cells, so concentrations of metabolites are considered to be very dynamic and may change rapidly from one time point in the other. So what we're getting with the metabolomic profile is just very brief insight into what's happening at that very moment. Um, often metabolomics, an advantage of metabolomics is it's non-invasive, so it's common for metabolomic studies to be of blood, um, so plasma or serum, um, or metabolomic studies in the urine. Uh, preliminary studies suggest that metabolomic alterations exist in people with MS with respect to global metabolomic profiles, specific pathways, and individual metabolites. Um, here, as an example, this small study uh, demonstrates differences in metabolomic profiles between controls and people with relapsing remitting MS. And this one demonstrates differences between uh, individuals with SPMS and relapsing remitting MS. 
Uh, these results are also consistent with observations from metabolomic studies of other neurologic disorders, including Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, as well as other autoimmune disorders. So for example, on the left, uh, this depicts overall differences in the CSF metabolome between people with dementia versus controls, uh, controls versus individuals with MCI. Um, and these are just some examples. There are several other studies in people with other neurologic diseases. Uh, however, with respect to MS, most current studies were the of small patient populations. They evaluated limited arrays of metabolites or lack links between metabolomic differences and uh, various patient characteristics, including disease severity. So as a result, to address these current gaps, our studies set out to identify metabolomic differences between MS patients and people with healthy and healthy controls, as well as characterize metabolomic correlates of disease severity in people with MS. Uh, so to do so, we performed a cross-sectional study. Uh, study participants were pulled from three sites. Uh, so the John Hopkins MS Center, the University of California at San Francisco, excuse me, as well as the Henry Ford Hospital um, and Accelerated Care Project, um, where included individuals could have at least one metabolomics assessment. Um, so metab, oh, sorry, <laughs> um, a subset of permission, Participants also had EDSS scores available, and a smaller subset had OCT or optical coherence tomography within 60, say, 60 days. Uh, the primary outcomes um, were comparing metabolomic profiles between people with MS and healthy controls. MS outcomes included uh, EDSS as well as the age related MS severity score, which is similar to the MSSS, except it uses age instead of disease duration. Uh, OCT outcomes included the thickness of the composite ganglion cell interplexiform layer, which is the retinal layer most strongly correlated with gray matter atrophy in people with MS. Metabolites were identified and relative abundances were assessed via mass spectrometry and metabolon for each cohort. Uh, metabolomics assessment performed in nine batches, includes plasma and serum batches. So uh, one batch from UCSF, one batch including um, uh, from the Henry Ford Accelerated Care Project, project, as well as nine uh, different, uh, or seven different batches from Johns Hopkins. Um, 32, 329 metabolites were measured across the nine batches and were eligible for inclusion in the analysis. Uh, we then applied a quality control procedure to make sure the included metabolites were reliable and confirmed that no sample outliers would be included. Uh, we then assessed and adjusted analyses for batch effects using the COMBAT algorithm. So COMBAT is an algorithm that was originally developed for analyses of gene expression, but has also been extended for scanner and site differences. Uh, so, and we did this because here on the left-hand side, you can see a clear batch effect um, using the first two principal components across the nine sets. Uh, then after using COMBAT, you can see here that the back to pair Batch effects appear to be minimized across similar dimensions, so using the first two principal components. Um, in addition, after adjusting for batch, there was no clear differences between serum and plasma. So here the green dots are serum and the red dots are plasma. Our metabolomics analyses also included both ba between batch and uh, within batch replicates. Um, so, or the same sample was included twice in the same metabolomics run. Uh, we then calculated the intra-class correlation coefficient between, for both between and within batch replicates. ICCs for both within and between batch replicates were generally high. Um, uh, the median for within batch correlates was 0 0.94, as well as between batch was uh, 0 0.79. Um, we excluded metabolites with ICCs less than 0 0.4 here, which is those less than the uh, dotted red line. Uh, we also tested for potential sample outliers using PCA. Um, and then the final analyses included 954 metabolomic samples from uh, 756 individuals, uh, including 269 metabolites. Uh, for statistical analyses, we compared metabolomic profiles between people with MS and healthy controls, considering global differences in the overall metabolome, differences in individual metabolites, as well as differences in composite metabolic pathway measures. Um, we did this in the three ways to ensure the robustness of their results, because each type of analysis tries to answer a similar question, but in slightly different ways. So are there differences in the metabolome between uh, people with MS and healthy controls? Um, so our first set analysis, we um, identified samples with highly divergent met 
uh, overall metabolomic composition. Uh, we created an age, sex, and race adjusted uh, metabolic dysfunction score based on dissimilarities between MS and uh, healthy controls. Um, so for this, we used the reference population as all healthy controls, and then uh, derived the score as the median dissimilarity among the adjusted uh, profiles in the MS patients from this reference set. So we identified highly divergent samples as those with above 90th percentile uh, among the reference set. We also compared individual metabolites. And lastly, we performed several sets of metabolic pathway-based analyses. First, we applied an agnostic approach where we derived novel sets of related metabolomes, metabolites using uh, a weighted gene expression correlation network analyses. Uh, WGCNA is a systems biology approach that was originally de developed to study correlation patterns in gene expression and has previously been extended to other settings. Uh, for the second approach, we applied or we classified metabolites into groups based on related biological functions. So, for example, tryptophan metabolism or using well known uh, metabolite, metabolite reactions. Um, we then applied a resampling based permutation algorithm to assign statistical significance. Um, Oh, and lastly, uh, to assess all these models used uh, GE regression models adjusting for age, sex, and race. Um, we needed to use GE because individuals could, uh, uh, could provide uh, more than one metabolomic sample. Then jumping right into the results, participants were aged approximately uh, 40 years and were predominantly female and non-Hispanic whites. Um, uh, the figure on the left depicts the distribution of age across the three different um, cohorts. Um, and then with respect to MS, the majority of participants had relapsing remitting MS. Disease duration was approximately 13 years and were on average moderately disabled. The median EDS score, EDSS score was three. Um, overall, we detected shift in the overall metabolomic profiles in people with MS relative to healthy controls using our adjusted metabolomic dysfunction store. We identified samples which were highly divergent from the reference set. So here as those beyond 90% of the metabolic dysfunction score. 21% um, of MS patients had metabolomic dysfunction scores greater than this threshold. Um, results were relatively consistent when we included patients who were not on a disease modifying therapy at the time of their blood uh, collection. Um, so then for the individual metabolite differences and then the agnostic approach um, for grouping metabolites together, on the left, we include this table includes the results of WGCNA analyses or the analyses of the networks using um, agnostic groups of metabolites that differed between uh, MS and healthy controls. So these p-values here are the ones that were significant at the uh, corrected p level of 0 0.05. 0 0.05. Uh, the top differences in groups of metabolites were those um, in aromatic amino acids or tryptophan, tyrosine, or phenylalanine metabolism. Um, then on the right are results of the individual metabolites. So this is a volcano plot depicting the negative log transformed p-value on the y-axis and the median difference between MS and healthy controls for the individual metabolites. So the red colored metabolites denote metabolites which were significant at the FDR level of 0 0.05. Uh, the circled metabolites here are just uh, some of those metabolites that were in the top module here. So the pink module, including lots of uh, aromatic amino acids. So those are just some of them. There's additionally more, but those are the top scoring metabolites. Um, here are the individual results plotted in slightly different ways, where you can see the actual distribution of significant metabolites and shift in the, um, in the way uh, the uh, distribution of aromatic am amino acids um, uh, are differ between MS, people with MS and healthy controls. So the orange are people with MS as well as the blue are the healthy controls. So on the left are tyrosine metabolites and then on the right are tryptophan, phenylalanine and other amino acid metabolites. Similarly, in analyses where we group metabolites a priori based on biologic function, um, we included, we identified highly statistically significant differences in metabolic pathways, including other aromatic amino acids, which you can see right here. Um, moving on towards disability, similar to our findings for overall metabolic dysfunction between people with MS and healthy controls, higher levels of metabolic dysfunction were associated with increased disability st status. MS patients using a cane, um, so right here in the blue, had the highest scores of metabolic dysfunction. 
Um, in analyses assessing the association between individual metabolites and EDS test scores, we observed reductions in uh, aromatic amino acids um, associated with higher EDS test scores independent of age. So for example, higher levels of P-crustal glucuronide, uh, P-crustal sulfite were positively associated with EDSS, while other aromatic amino acids like hydroxyphenolactate, which you can see right here, or imidazole lactate uh, were inversely associated with MS. Um, so intriguingly, these metabolites are largely produced by different uh, pathways. Um, aromatic amino acids can be metabolized by the gut microbiota, by uh, specific genes in the mi gut microbiota. So the red circle metabolites here are products of oxidative metabolism, the p crustals glucuronide, uh, p crustal sulfite, or phenylalanine glutamine. Um, these aprobiforin have been found by previous studies to be uremic metabotoxins. Uh, then the blue circled metabolites are products of the reductive pathway of aromatic amino acids. Um, so just to go into this in a little bit more detail, metabolism of aromatic amino acids can follow two paths, an uh, oxidative path as well as a reductive path, uh, which are metabolized with sp specific enzymes in the gut microbiota for each path. What we observed in our initial metabolomic studies is that people with MS tend to have a shift towards oxidative metabolism in red uh, versus reductive metabolism in blue. To assess this more explicitly, we utilize ratios um, derived from these pathways for individual amino acids. So the ratio of oxidative versus reductive pathway metabolisms. So it's a shift towards the more metabotoxin, uh, the bad metabolites. Um, so for example, we know that highly significant associations between the ratio of oxidative to reductive metabolites for tyrosine. Um, so for here, we can see the distribution of these ratios for people with MS versus the healthy control in orange and blue. Um, and then the differences for use of cane versus not cane um, in people with MS. Uh, results were similar for other aromatic amino acids, um, including phenylalanine and tryptophan, where we again note the shift in ratios of people with MS versus healthy controls, as well as uh, 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 versus use of cane versus not. Um, uh, uh, towards more oxidative uh, versus reductive metabolites. Likewise, for OCT studies, since our sample size was relatively limited, we restricted our analyses to only evaluating metabolites which are significantly different with people with MS and key metabolite ratios of interest. So these metabolites right here. Um, we observed consistent differences in lower metabolite levels being associated with thinner GCIP, which is generally associated with lower gray matter volumes, um, thinner uh, as suggested by previous research. So putting this all together, our results suggest that disruption in uh, downstream metabolism, several aromatic amino acids is associated both with MS risk and with disability level. We've found that reductive pathway metabolites, so lactate metabolites like uh, hydroxyphenolactate, for example, were largely reduced in people with MS and shifted towards oxidative pathway metabolites like p crustal sulfite, um, uh, phenylacetylglutamine. Um, so this is important as previous evidence demonstrates that lower reductive, reductive pathway metabolites, so um, those in the blue, are associated with decreases in AHR activity, leading to decreases in regulatory T cells, lower IL-10, and increases in um, astrocyte-mediated uh, inflammation. Lower levels are also associated with reduced HCA receptor activity, which is highly expressed on innate immune cells and may be involved in anti-inflammatory responses. In contrast, higher levels of oxidative pathway metabolites correspond to increases in metabotoxins, which can increase NF-kappa B, um, uh, reactive oxidative species, and systemic inflammation. So what's interesting, these uh, aromatic amino acid metabolites are largely produ products of gut microbial metabolism and specific bacterial genes. Um, so for reductive versus oxidative. So the poor A gene in the oxidative pathway is the FLDH gene among the uh, reductive pathway. 
Um, to make sure our findings were robust, we performed several sets of sensitivity analyses. We adjusted for BMI when it was available, which unfortunately wasn't in all of the cohorts. Um, we also attempted to ensure that the observed results were not driven solely by age. So for example, the adjusted mean difference between MS and healthy controls for a given metabolite was not associated with how strongly a metabolite correlated with age and healthy controls, which you can see here. So for example, both correlations here were insignificant and less than 0.1. Uh, we also adjusted our analytic approach. So since we had nine batches, we repeated all analyses, excluding one batch at a time. Um, we're using a leave one out procedure to confirm one batch wasn't driving the results. We also observed similar results when we conducted analyses separately between batches and pooled results using meta-analysis. Um, at the end of the day, um, while this study was large, uh, it's still a cross-sectional study, so it would be really important to incorporate longitudinal results to evaluate if differences in the metabolites are associated with changes in MS outcomes like disability or brain atrophy, um, as well as including more diverse populations since over 80% of our cohort was white. Um, next, our study wasn't optimal to identify differences in metabolome related to DMTs, so we couldn't optimally assess which metabolomic changes as a result of DMT initiation. Metabolomic differences have also been noted in the context of some comorbidities. So uh, changes in branched-chain amino acids may occur before the onset of diabetes or other comorbidities. And it will also be important to incorporate information on lifestyles. Some, some studies um, use metabolomics as a way to measure adherence to a specific diet. Uh, next, we also note that we observed differences in metabolites derived from the, gut the metabolism of gut microbiota. However, we didn't actually measure uh, what was going on in the gut microbiota. So it would be really important to confirm these differences uh, in uh, uh, levels of relative abundances of the genes um, that we think are important here. Um, Lastly, um, we also started to try to integrate with other types of data to understand what functional consequences these metabolites may have. Uh, for example, some preliminary results demonstrate that differences in the transcription of aromatic amino acid related genes in monocyte uh, differ in the blood and CSF between people with MS and healthy controls. Lastly, and along these same lines, and I wanted to end with this cartoon, I didn't make it, but I think it's pretty informative. Um, metabolomics is probably just one component to consider um, that can be related to who gets MS and how it evolves over time. Um, and that strategies that incorporate multiple levels of biological data, as well as information on environmental exposures and analytic methods to be able to make sense of these interactions is likely going to be necessary. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge our collaborators and our funding, um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Kate, for that really excellent talk. Um, any questions from the crowd? <laughs> Hi, Kate, this is Maria. Um, great talk, and thank you for all that information. I just have a quick question, and I know that you acknowledge that, of course, this wasn't longitudinal, but do you have like any uh, like trends in small exploratory analysis about how constant in time do you get to see these metabolomic changes? At least measure in two times and see if you have some of yeah. that data. Yeah, actually, um, I didn't include it, but we did look at like how um, the variation, uh, the metabolome is pretty stable um, over time. So some of the, um, the between batch sample, or we included some multiple samples from uh, the same person, and sometimes those were separated by maybe a year or two years. Um, and those people, uh, the metabolomic profile was relatively constant. Um, I wish I had a backup slide with that information, but <laughs> it's more or less constant. Oh, thank you. Kate, do you have recommendations for folks who may be starting or thinking about doing studies of metabolomics with respect to consistency and sample collection or other things they may want to record um, related to recent behaviors and things like that. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I think time of day, time since last meal, um, which is another limitation I didn't cite here, but it's also important. Um, some of the metabolites change as a result of what you ate yesterday, for example. Um, so it'd be important to have that information. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's important to sort of standardize the time of day or it's just more important to at least record it so that 
it can be dealt with statistically? Um, I think realistically, right, um, that you can't really say we're only going to camp like collect samples from now. Um, so I think the very least record the time um, so that you can incorporate it later or make sure that um, they're specific groups. Does anyone else have any questions? We can unmute. Yeah, I have a question, Kate. That was really interesting. Um, so thank you for sharing that. And it was obviously a lot of work. Um, uh, so, um, so there's been some suggestion, and Nick Brenton is, is one of the people leading this, of the potential value of the ketogenic diet in MS. And people not only, I think it's, it, I'm quoting Nick now, because this is not my work, but I think it's really interesting that um, I think he would share that um, some of the benefit of the ketogenic diet um, in his patient pilot work anyway, and um, is reduced fatigue, increased sense of energy, um, increased quality of life on people who stayed on the diet long enough. Now they did lose weight um, considerably, so there may have been uh, you know, a BMI component to it. But interestingly, some of the metabolite, metabolites that you were showing there on the favorable side would also go up if you're ketotic, I think, if I remember my pathways correctly, and I've been a while. So can you comment on the type of diet that might promote a healthier meta metabolomic environment? Um, that'd be my first question. The second would be, would a research model of a strict dietary adherence for a period of time with MS patients and controls allow some of the variants of last meal, certain meals, certain food types to be moved and then really see if, if given the same diet, MS patients metabolize very differently? Yeah, I think those are a lot of really good questions and um, I don't know if I necessarily have all the answers. Um, so uh, with the respect to the first one, so the ketogenic diet, um, I think at least I've looked at like I don't know the person you're specifically talking about in MS, but I know in general in the ketogenic diet, um, they do see kind of similar changes um, as what we're seeing here. Um, but I think uh, some of those metabolites also change with um, like other diets that are just like considered a healthy diet. <laughs> um, and so like for us, uh, we did a study on intermittent calorie restriction um, where we see kind of shifts in, I don't know, the, same core of metabolites. So some of the amino acids and the um, uh, amino acids and the like branch chain amino acids kind of shifted among people who were fasting uh, or people who had their calories re reduced a little bit each day. So like if you went on a diet, for example, and they kind of changed in a similar way. Um, so I don't know, it's, I don't know if we can necessarily tease apart fasting versus weight loss, um, at least at this point from people at MS. Interesting. Thanks. Thank you, Kate. And I think if there are other questions, please include them in the chat or send them to me and I can forward them on to Kate um, after the talks. So our final speaker is Dr. Riley Beauvais. She is an assistant professor of neurology at UCSF and she's going to talk to us today, an excellent title I would say, about <laughs> sex differences in clinical trials absence of evidence or evidence of absence. Riley, thanks for being here today. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Ellen, for the invitation. Um, good to see you all. And, you know, um, so interesting, Kate, to hear your really interesting, innovative new work. So um, in terms of uh, interest of time, I think what I'm going to do, a lot of this is actually a repeat of what I presented at Extrems this year. Um, but the, the thing that uh, really strikes me if I would love to hear from all of you what your thoughts are about this topic and sort of, you know, what, what, um, whether there should, you know, we should come up with some kind of uh, minimum amount of evidence required when analyzing new trials to really uh, bridge some of these gaps in, in research and knowledge. So I'll try to move very quickly through these slides so that we can really get to the discussion part. Um, and um, just thinking, let me just get this. Uh, just thinking from a perspective of sort of this mandate to look at sex as a biological variable and here thinking about sex, not necessarily gender, which are the behaviors, roles, expectations, as we all know, activities within society. Um, and really just to note that there's been sort of a long history, uh, you know, 20, 30 years of sort of trying to move governmental organizations forward um, to balance uh, 
sex and studies. And, you know, it's really taken a long time and there's still a lot of gaps. And so what are these gaps when we think about um, multiple sclerosis, knowing that we have sex biases and incidents and prevalence? Um, and so I'll just move quickly through some of these pieces, but there are uh, sex differences, biological sex differences in multiple steps in the PK and our PD pathways. Um, and um, despite this, uh, Zolpidem was, not, was really the first drug that actually had any sex-specific dosage guidelines um, in its label. And that took, you know, uh, 20 years after its FDA approval for those guidelines to show up. Um, and there isn't a lot of information in labels or elsewhere about potential sex specific differences in either efficacy or safety of medications. Um, so um, I'll kind of breeze through these because these will be well familiar to everybody, but there are uh, commonly reported sex differences in MS scores. And I'll really note here that these are mainly from observational studies. And so there are clearly still gaps in understanding sex differences in um, interventional trials where, where there may not be the same biases in reporting or other that could influence um, some of these observations, but um, the three to one female to male sex ratio, uh, men tending to be slightly older at presentation to have more progressive course, more atrophy, um, and potentially fewer relapses. And yet men and women tend to reach disability milestones at similar ages. Um, and again, there may be biases that have not been incomplete, that have not been completely worked out from the observational studies. Um, so Maria Houchins and I actually um, did a paper looking at sex differences in interventional trials. Um, and just as a, oh goodness, hello. Um, hi guys. As a, <laughs> there we have some friends. <laughs> Sorry, uh, this morning. Um, but the, the, the um, sex, if you think about sex ratio in clinical trials, um, do you want to be representative of, of, the of the clinical population, or do you want to be able to precisely understand impact on, um, on men and women separately? And so um, there's sort of a, a powering of trials uh, issue here, um, because if you want to be representative of people living with MS as a cohort, you may tend towards the sort of the more the three to one. Um, sex ratio, but if you want to really be able to look at sex as a biological variable, you'd have to change that, um, that those enrollment criteria significantly in order to be able to look at both men and women equally. Um, and then also, do you want a power towards inflammation if we uh, sort of take the idea that women tend to have more inflammatory MS? Um, you'll be well powered if you have more women in the study. If you want to power towards progression, and this is what we see in the progressive MS trials, of course, um, you're, there's more even in women. And so um, I, this is uh, the paper that Maria Hutchins and I did together. I will caution you that there's a massive problem with the references, um, which we've informed the, the publishers multiple times and we've been trying to get sorted out for a long time. Um, and so the, the references are, are, are all wrong in this paper and um, despite despite our best efforts and ongoing efforts. So if anybody is interested in this paper, I'd be happy to send you a version with corrected references because it's really important to get it right. Um, but uh, sort of we looked at all the, the DMTs that had been approved by either the FDA or EMA up to 2018 um, and then looked at all the, fit, the pivotal trials that had led to the approval of these uh, medications. And um, when there are uh, lacking data, we consulted with every single MSL to try to get more information from them, um, anything unpublished, anything in posters, abstracts, et cetera, that could help us um, inform um, our understanding. And we looked at a number of features. Um, so I'll go through these one by one. We first, the basic question was, are men and women different at, at enrollment? Um, because if men and women are different at enrollment, um, if, 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 if men are older or um, have a higher uh, ARR in the year prior to enrollment, et cetera, there may be differences in the trial and you're only uh, really incompletely evaluating them when you just look at um, sex and age and other features separately uh, in your um, in your sensitivity analyses. And there are basically no one presented just a simple table comparing men and women at enrollment in the trials, which seems pretty uh, shocking to us. And we looked again and again and no one, no one did it. Um, and then um, were there any pre-specified sensitivity analyses sort of stratifying by sex? And um, some of them did um, have these pre-planned analyses. 
Um, those that reported them didn't identify any sex differences. Um, but again, if you don't, if the men and women are different at baseline, stratifying by sex is only going to be part of the story. Um, if there's differences in age or um, or uh, inflammatory patterns, etc. And so, are you just adjusting for sex differences, and also are you looking for sex differences in in advocacy? Um, what about pre-specified stratification of adverse events? Um, uh, so for instance, we know that ocrelizumab infusion reactions are more common in women than men um, when you adjust for some other covariates, but none of the trials did this. Um, some trials did, of course, report on, on um, side effects that are only possible in one in one sex. So, for instance, um, well, not only possible, but most, most likely in one sex, such as breast cancer um, and then vaginal infections. And then what about some post hoc studies? So there were some post hoc studies and one of the most important ones was the post hoc exploration of the PROMISE trial where um, among men only, glitarimer was associated with a significant delayed progression disability. And there were a lot of post hoc analyses of this. And eventually this uh, difference was attributed not to a sex-related treatment effect, whereby glitarimer may be more effective in men, but just that men had more uh, rapid progression and therefore more, more likely to, you're more likely to uncover a treatment effect in the short trial. Um, and then was there adequate statistical power? So did any trial even comment on this? And the answer was no. Um, and then were there sex differences uh, mentioned in the product uh, uh, at package insert? And uh, there were some scattered uh, mentions, um, but uh, really only mentioned in four of the 13 overall product labels, um, either of safety or efficacy. And finally, um, of importance, most trials, as we know, um, only enroll participants up to age 50 or 55. And, um, and uh, so therefore, the postmenopausal experience, for instance, is, is, is markedly absent in the trials. Um, they also, of course, uh, warrant that um, women who are considering childbearing be excluded, even though accidental pregnancies have happened in all the trials, including even in teraflunamide, uh, where uh, people were cautioned, cautioned again against pregnancies. And so we don't really, we can't really look at sort of adult life stages, such as uh, the menopausal period, et cetera, and from the trial data. So just to summarize, you know, there's just really in my mind, an incomplete evaluation of sex differences. Um, and so, if, and also just adjusting for sex differences in a, in a sort of sub, you know, sub analysis isn't the same thing as looking for potential sex differences and understanding these either in terms of uh, PK, PD or otherwise. Um, and so since the analyses are very feasible given the data, um, there's really a couple questions about why aren't they reported <laughs> in any substantial way? And so the first question is just, is this just a scientific blind spot? And this is really um, hard, you know, going back to the, the Annals of Neurology paper and sort of Emmanuel's leadership on this issue among others, um, are, is the lack of female representation on steering committees actually resulting in a huge blind spot in terms of looking at uh, meaningful sex differences and really understanding whether they're there or not? Um, the second question is, is there a marketing decision? I mean, you know, could there be some and, and, and pharma doesn't want us to, to know. Um, uh, and then another is, is there lack of scientific power? Again, going back to sort of the, the issues of uh, sex ratio um, and um, prevalence of MS. And then finally, could there just be no sex difference and there's just a marked publication bias against negative results? Um, so I'll actually stop here, and I'd love to hear people's perspectives on this, people who thought a lot more um, about clinical trials and epidemiology. Thank you so much, Riley. It's a really, I think, important, uh, important topic. And, um, you know, obviously, since uh, many, many more women are affected by um, MS and men, and we have many <laughs> biological phases of our lives. I think uh, this is sort of a really important contribution that you're bringing to raise awareness. Um, I um, wondered, you know, we're talking about clinical trials, but, you know, even in observational data sets, um, is this something that people should be spending a little bit more time thinking about um, as they analyze large cohort level data? 
I mean, the one thing that you know, strikes me is um, the, the sex differences in relapse rate has really been described mainly um, in observational studies. And I just wonder about potential for biases um, in, in men under reporting their relapses and really having to look you know, at GAD lesions, for instance, or sort of you know, more objective um, markers of, uh, of inflammatory changes over time, where sort of trying to finish up an analysis of mosaic data, um, where as you may all know, um, the mosaic actually pulls together uh, all of the placebo arms from clinical trials. And so you can look in the placebo arms um, of, of major trials. And um, we're not really seeing a sex difference in relapse rates in, in the placebo arm in, across multiple trials. Um, and it suggests that there may be something about ascertainment. And I, and I think that's something that we should definitely be thinking more about in the observational study. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've often wondered if that that underreporting in the real world, though, might be the difference in, you know, why men are more likely to present in the you know, primary yeah. phase, right, of, of yeah. illness, yeah. right, if they're not reporting on, on symptoms yeah. and they never call anything a relapse. And maybe, oops, sorry, that's not, um, may, and maybe that's, that's where gender comes in, it's not all sex, <laughs> you know, right. in the sense that maybe yeah. there, be, there may be different gender expectations in different areas, and in fact, um, I spoke with a, a clinician who was uh, Turkish and who said that the, the, the expectations around sort of symptom reporting and sort of the, the sick role is very different in Turkey than it is, for instance, in, in, in the United States uh, mm -hmm. between men and women. And potentially we could also uncover gender, gender differences there as well that may be interesting. Mm -hmm. Are there um, sort of standardized um questionnaires um, that you use or would recommend to people to sort of not under, only understand biological sex at birth, but also to explore um, gender and other issues or any other sort of biological stages um, in women and men um, as they're doing their work? I think you really, you know, number one, want to just really um, take all the confounds that we that have been reported to date and then actually look at sex differences in those um, okay. so that you're not explaining some interesting things away. Um, I think the second thing is actually if you're looking at relapses, um, you know, using a, a standardized relapse assessment um, and, and frequently asking um, and really doing a thorough review of systems as opposed to just asking um, sort of open-ended questions about interval changes, um, because the more you press, the more you get, especially um, if there are gender roles where you're not supposed to complain. Um, so I, I've found that the more I press, the more, <laughs> you know, uh, the more uh, sort of granular data I get from, from my mm -hmm. patients. Um, so I think those things are really important when we're when we're talking to patients. And then in terms of uh, beyond the beyond the um, the uh, all those really important potential confounders and potential mediators of sex differences, um, I think we have to engage older patients in the trials as well. We have to get. 55 and above. Um, you know, our patients are using drugs into their 60s and 70s, and we don't give them enough guidance on safety or efficacy. So that's really important as well, especially as the inflammatory risk seems to dwindle or decrease after, you know, 50 or so. We should be looking in that older cohort. Are there other questions from the, the group? It looks like lots of people are having to move on and sending nice, yeah, nice messages for sure. in the chat. <laughs> yeah. So just to wrap up, thank you, uh, Riley, Kate, and Laura for three really excellent talks. Um, these will all be posted on the IOM's website. So if you want to point your colleagues to them, that'll be really great. Um, I did just want to point out that IOM's continues to host occasional um, COVID-19 talks and the next one is scheduled actually for Wednesday the 18th. Um, so definitely encourage you to join. Um, also really interested in the Global Epi uh, Conference anyways and ensuring we're representative in all ways, geographic representation, sex gender representation, and race, ethnicity, et cetera, representation. So, you know, please nominate your colleagues um, to give talks. You can see that we're a very supportive group and uh, we're, we're here to kind of 
allow everyone's voice to be heard. Um, so if you have a talk that you'd like to give or um, you know, want to nominate somebody to give a talk. We don't limit it only to women. <laughs> we try to make the talks occur um, at a time that kind of accommodates the people who are speaking. Um, and so please send me and Karina an email. Um, we'd be happy to slate you in for the pending um, January uh, seminar. All right. Thank you all. I hope you stay healthy and safe and have a great rest of your Monday.